name is Michael Nystrom. I don't have a proper uh, PowerPoint slide that describes my, describes my name. Uh, I'm not going to do this in Danish. Uh, I'm not even going to try. But what, what, are, what we are going to do is talk about Windows Server 2016. That will be released very soon. Like on Ignite. Um, the current version that we have is technical preview number five. Um, the technical preview number five is not production ready. Um, people have been trying it and they complain about all kinds of weird things. Which they should because it doesn't work. It is a technical preview. So the qu first question we have from customers is, when can we expect Windows Server 2016 to be ready? Do we need to wait for a service pack? No, you don't need to wait for a service pack. There will never be one. But you do need to wait for other things, depending on what you are going to do with it. There's a lot of new features, features that relate to hardware. Things like Packet Direct that is eventually going to replace NDIS as the lower level. Well, for Packet Direct to work, we need to have a firmware in the network adapter that actually supports Packet Direct. That means maybe there's going to be firmware upgrades for some of the network adapters. And yes, of course, it also requires a new driver. Yep, that also means we need to wait for the new driver. As long as you're running a virtual machine and you're playing around and you're testing, that's going to be fine. But do expect a couple of months before upgraded device drivers and other features around Windows Server is good enough to be used, or at least you can use all the functionality. It's kind of boring to set up a system and say, hey, it's really cool. Do you use any of the features? No, because the hardware I have doesn't support that. Um, there's a lot of things. Um, how many of you have played with Server 2016? You like it? Yeah. Looks like Windows 10, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's like Windows Server 2012 R2 with a new start menu. I have this question that always pops up when I do presentation. Uh, it's like, well, we're not going to really run the Hyper-V stuff. We're going to do VMware. So can you just briefly tell me all the new features that is going to be in the system if we're going to run on a VMware platform and not do any fancy stuff? You have a start menu. Any more questions? Because that's it. And this is something you really need to understand with Windows Server 2016. If you are going to do exactly the same thing you are doing today, nothing will change at all. If you have cornflakes for breakfast and there's a new release of cornflakes, it will taste the same thing, right? Because everything is now focused on three parts. Security, infrastructure, and application platform. Oh, we're not going to deploy applications. In that case, nothing will change. What is the biggest change in DHCP? Nothing at all. Right? So for some customers, 2016 will be a, a, a huge change. And for some customers, nothing happens at all. Right? You do need to understand that. Security. Well, security affects us all. Uh, what they've done is basically credential guard and just enough administration and just in time administration. Credential guard is the same thing you have in Windows 10, requires UFI based machines. It should be used to prevent machines from storing the hash of the domain administrator. Well, I'm, I'm not logging as a domain admin. No, you are not doing that. I really hope you're not being a domain admin when you log on to a member server. Anybody done that? Please don't raise your hand. Because it happens all the time, and it's stored in the local registry, and everybody else that is a local admin can now steal your hash. I don't need to be Einstein to do that even. Yes, question, sir. Nothing. It has nothing to do with that. I can still steal your... I can steal you. Well, it does, it just stores it differently. 
So the hash is always stored. I have no idea what password you have, but I can steal your hash. And the thing is that I can now authenticate against something using that hash. I still don't know what, what password you have, right? I have no idea, but I'm being you. And then I can create another account. And there's always someone with more privileges than I have that has logged on to the system. So it's not about protecting user account, it's protecting the administrative accounts that are used heavily in an organization, right? That's credential guard. Uh, if you don't have Windows Server 2016, you can still use another group in Active Directory. How many of you have ever heard of a group called Protected Users? Yes, that's great. Are you a member of that group? <laughs> you are. And what does happen when you are a member of that group? Yeah, well, it requires you to do interactive logon, right? And it does only authenticate using Kerberos, and it doesn't store the hash. So you can only use it for, for maintenance work, and it can't be NTLM and stuff like that. So it's better than to do nothing if it works, but credential reward is better. Uh, JIT and GI, just enough administration, just in time administration. That's using PowerShell proxy basically to limit the amount of uh, commands you can actually perform during a specific time. That's the anti Snowden thing because it, it's invented based on Snowden, the guy that really did have too much permissions. That's a fact today, right? You are an admin in a domain. Can can you do that? Can you work in a domain at like 4 a.m. in the morning? Yeah. Do you do that? <laughs> exactly. I have the same issues. Like, oh, it's quiet. It's cool. So I can work. Uh, but the problem is that if if someone actually gain access to your account. Uh, nobody really understands that it's used in the wrong way because nobody really have any kind of blocking issue. Most customers I see when I work with security is that they have two levels, nothing or everything. It's, it's simple to manage. Are you a nothing guy or an everything guy? I'm an everything guy. That can be changed, but it does require you to shift into using PowerShell as a management tool or a front end to PowerShell, otherwise it doesn't work. Uh, they also add um, Defender to the system, which is kind of nice. Uh, we're going to talk more about Shielded VMs, but Shielded VMs is basically a, a method in Server 2016 to protect virtual machines. It actually works. It doesn't work the way we want it to work today. Um, it's going to work the way we want it to work when they release it, because currently the Guardian service that you have, the host Guardian service needs to run in the same domain as everything else is running in, and that prevents the security. The basic idea of host Guardian services is this. I'm running a virtual machine in Hyper-V. It's running on that host, and you are managing that host and I own the data. Well, the problem is that you can turn the machine off. You shouldn't, but you can. And then you can mount the hard drive, and then you can grab everything. Well, I will, I will notice that, right? I mean, it's, it's turning off my whatever business server. I'm, of course, I'm going to see that. Well, you can clone it while it's running, and then you can mount the hard drive. And then I can't see that. So today, when you run anything, at a host provider or anywhere else, you really need to trust the guy that is actually running that machine because they can do whatever they like with it. Host Guardian Services is, is, is designed to prevent this. So I have the key server, the host Guardian Service. The host Guardian Service will provide a key to your host if I approve that host, if I approve you or the provider, then you can run it. But at the same time, we will allow the system to use a virtual TPM ship to encrypt the hard drive, and, and, and I own the key. You can run it, I own the key. So even if you can turn it off or do a copy, you can't really access the machine data because that is encrypted and I have the key, right? 
But that doesn't prevent people from using the virtual KVM switch, and it doesn't prevent people from using the network to sniff it. So at the same time, a shielded VM also includes that. So when you try to connect to a shielded VM, it's black. You can't do anything with it because it's encrypted. It's encrypted and it's protected. Eventually, this will work in other environments as well. I expect this to show up in Azure eventually or sooner or maybe maybe soon. I don't know. Maybe. Well, cloud first. Yeah. So, and, 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 and the whole purpose is very simple. I have a bunch of stuff that I really need to protect, but I would like to run it over here. Today, that is tricky because there's a trust issue. Do you automatically trust everyone? I don't. So it's kind of nice. So they've done a lot of things in security. Uh, most of this comes from Windows 10, because Windows 10 and 2016, of course, share code. There's a mass massive amount of code that is exactly the same. So that's fine. Security is easy. Either you use it or you don't use it. The problem is this. The, um, <laughs> the infrastructure part. Well, they've done a couple of things that is, you know, rolling cluster upgrades, Linux support, rolling cluster upgrade actually works. Linux works really great. Microsoft loves Linux for some reason. Rolling upgrades is meant for fabric. How many of you know what fabric means? A few of you. Okay. And that's one of the problems we have. Now, a traditional infrastructure is very easy. It's a big box of crap. Sorry, a big box of stuff. You have a network, you put servers, you put clients, users, data, everything is in here. Some customers will do segregate the different networks and say, here, here's VLAN client and here's VLAN servers. But basically, everything is on the same network. It's, it's nothing fancy. It's always been like that, right? And we are struggling hard with protecting data from users and protecting users from killing other users and stuff like that. <clears throat> now, when you build a fabric, you do it differently. You divide it into parts. That is a real segmentation. It's really, if you're on one side, you can't even see the other side. Well, depending on what side you are. In the lower part, you run what's called a fabric. The fabric has a Two small typos. That would need to be slightly bigger. The fabric, in the fabric, we have storage. In the fabric, we have switches. In the fabric, we have hypervisors. In the fabric, we have a management stack. And this runs on a separate network with separate IP addresses. And the management stack also contains a separate domain. This is the fabric domain. It's both a domain and a network, and it's totally isolated from everything. You can't see this. It doesn't exist. But it runs everything physical. On top of that, you then run a virtualized environment. And in the virtualized environment, you have the virtualized domain controller that users are actually accessing and logging on. And here's the exchange server, and here's the configuration manager server, and here's the file server, print server, the users, and everything is here. Everything is virtualized, more or less. There's always going to be one machine that you can't virtualize for any weird reason. It needs the plug-in or PCI card. It doesn't work. Hey, it's going to run in that environment as well. There's one connection between these two platforms. And the only connection you have is going to be if there's any connection. It's going to be Active Directory Federation Services. This is a fabric design. This is the only way we build infrastructures today. We always separate them from the existing environment. 
you have something and I don't really care what you have. But you ask me and say, hey, can you help me build this? Absolutely. I'm going to fly in. We're going to build a new fabric domain and we're going to take everything you have and put the old stuff, whatever you had, on top of this. How long time do you think it takes to build a fabric? Uh, and just to give you some numbers, uh, a company with 2,000 VMs and a couple of hundred servers and they need to build a fabric. How long time does it take to build if nothing exists at all? Four and a half hour. It doesn't include the time it takes to rack the darn servers because that's going to take a day or two just to mount them. But according to the fact that they are mounted, it takes approximately four and a half hour. Then it takes approximately two weeks to explain for the customer what we did. That's called knowledge transfer. And it's not really the speed of my ability to transfer. It's more of the consuming side in the other end. You can't really talk that fast because someone needs to understand. The beauty of this is that I don't care what you run on top. You can run a Windows or Linux or whatever environment. Underneath here is the fabric environment. Doesn't this look very much like Azure Cloud? Cloud first. <laughs> and that's the only thing Microsoft is focusing on. That means the focus is going to be Hyper-V, storage, network, automation, and management. Hey, but we run VMware. Yeah, I know. Um, then you have a start menu. That is different. Uh, yes. <laughs> so this is a fabric design. Now you all know what a fabric design is. Hopefully. And here. So they support that. And one of the things they did add is the network controller. Now the network controller is really interesting because if you do run and something else than Hyper-V, this doesn't apply at all. But if you do use Hyper-V, it makes so much sense. The network controller supports the ability to manage physical switches using a protocol called OMI, which means that I can use PowerShell to configure all the switches. Kind of nice. I wouldn't say all the switches, the switches that supports OMI. Which one is that? Depending on who you ask, according to Microsoft, every switch that has been sold the last five years supports that. In reality, that's not really true. But every switch with a brand, like Cisco, Arista, Aruba, stuff like that. So it does control that. But it also contains a distributed firewall. That means that we now have a network controller that can control the operating system's firewall. So depending on how and where you move the virtual machine, the firewall rule will be applied automatically wherever it is, which is not really the fact when you have a physical hardware firewall because it's going to protect the network. A physical firewall never protects data. It doesn't protect the server. It protects the network. And if you move the machine from that network, the protection is kind of useless. But we never move the machines. Yes, you do. And if you don't do it today, you will in the future. You're going to move between different networks and different workloads and stuff like that. But it also contains a load balancer. And this is the exact same load balancers they run in Azure which means that you now can create a load balancing with network address translation in both directions, the same way you can do in Azure. If we install this on a Windows Server 2016 server, nothing happens. I just added the network controller. Yep. I included the management tools. Yes, you did. And you can open PowerShell. And then you can configure it in PowerShell. Okay. Can I see anything? Well, you can do get. How do you configure stuff? You do new or set. The GUI, 
the graphical interface for the network controller is actually not in Windows. It's somewhere else. It just happens to be in System Center Virtual Machine Manager because that's the UI for network controller. Because it's intended to work in the fabric. And in the fabric, System Center Virtual Machine Manager plays a crucial part. They also add something called Storage Spaces Direct. Anybody played with Storage Spaces Direct? This is fun. Storage Spaces Direct is, is basically storage without buying a SAM. What kind of SAM do you think they use in Amazon? They, they don't use a SAM in Amazon. What kind of SAM do you think they use in Azure? They, they don't use a SAM. So 80% of the world's combined data force does not run on a SAM. And they don't run VMware either. They run either Hyper-V or KVM. <laughs> when they run on local storage and they replicate it. So why is that? It's cheaper. A SAN is very expensive. So Microsoft don't want to have a SAN. They need storage, so they invented storage spaces. Now, the problem with storage spaces that we have in 2012 R2 is very simple. The standard of SAS is, well, it's not really a standard. It's more of a a guideline on how to do things. So this SAS controller doesn't work with this SAS drive for no reason whatsoever. Uh, well, you can change the firmware. Well, then it doesn't work with that SAS drive. And you can play around with that. And I've done that over the past years. And it's very exciting. So what we do here is that we do it differently. <clears throat> we do it very differently. D differently. I can't even speak. So here we have four servers, STO 1, 2, 3, and 4, uh, fancy servers. We need to bump up the size. And yes, I'm, I'm using PowerShell. It is possible to do a lot of things using the UI, like logging on and logging off. That could be used uh, still, uh, as, as least as you have a, a core server or a, or a GUI server. If you have a nano, you can't do that either. Um, and and the reason why, the reason why I do use PowerShell, and, and people go like, oh, you, you you're scripting everything to automate everything. Not really. But I need to document what I do, and since I'm always doing something incorrect, I need to be able to repeat it again, with slight modifications to, to the settings. And, 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 and trying to remember a sequence of 6,492 clicks, that doesn't work for me. Maybe it works for you. I, I can't do that. I'm, I'm too stupid or what? something like that. So you can't do most of it. These four servers, they have nine hard drives. And this, they can, of course, be physical, and it should be physical. So what kind of hard drives do you need to have? You need to have SATA drives. Are SATA drives cheaper than SAS drives? Are they cheaper because they are worse? The quality is lower. They are slower. They are bad. You can't use SATA drives in a business environment. Exactly. I don't have redundant data, path, and that's the only difference. Other than that, as long as you buy an enterprise grade drive, right? Okay. So we're not talking about consumer SATA drives. So why is it that SAS drives are more expensive then? It's a license fee included in SAS, because SAS as a protocol and a chip is owned by a company. And if you want to build a SAS drive, you need to buy the chip from them. And they charge for it. It's weird, right? But they charge for stuff they sell. SATA doesn't have that issue. It's just the standard. So it's just defined how it should work, right? So according to, to specifications, you still need to have enterprise-grade risks, but SATA is fine. But it doesn't have a multiple data path. That's true. 
But if we put them locally on four servers and use network and replicate data, it doesn't matter because we don't need multiple paths to the drives because we have the data stored in multiple locations. And that's what we do. The only features you need to have is file server and file over clustering. And the only test you need to do is storage spaces direct inventory network system configuration. You create a cluster and then you enable what's called cluster S2D, storage spaces direct. Now that can only be done in PowerShell. All the other ones can be done manually if you like to click. But that line can only be done that way. Now the real command is going to be that one. Enable cluster S2D. Verbose just because it's fun to see text. But you can't do that when you play in a virtual machine. Because it's going to find out that you don't have a hard drive with some kind of specification. Because the default setting when you run this is very simple. It's going to try to figure out what kind of hard drives you have. So you have an SSD drive, you have a bunch of SSD drives, you have some hard drives, maybe you have an NVMe drive. It's going to figure that out and use these drives accordingly and then try to create a pool of everything. But when you run it virtualized because you're playing with it, all the drives are set to, I have no idea what I am. And that can be fixed, but it can only be fixed after you have created the pool. So the command line you run in a virtual environment when you're playing with it to learn is that one. Enable cluster S2D, cache mode disable auto config, which turns off the automatic configuration. And you also do a skip liability checks because otherwise it's going to be really angry and say, hey, I couldn't find any usable drives in your environment. Turning off. Then we create the pool. And when you created the pool, you can now cheat. And I cheated. So I said that in slot one, because they also have slots, it's virtual slots, but now, and you can't flash the slot. I'm so sorry, it's a virtual slot. Um, so the slot one is set to SSD. Uh, all the other ones are set to HD. And then we set the first drive to be a journal disk, because that's the local journaling uh, data that is stored. And then I flip uh, uh, slot two, three, and four to SSD drives, which means I now have both HDD drives, I have SSD drives, and I have e-journal disk. Now I can do everything in PowerShell, but uh, it's so much more fun to do it here. I hope. Let's see if we can find a cluster. Oh, we have a cluster. And I don't have any roles. I do have four nodes. I do only have one network, which is just a demo environment. Usually you have multiple network, you need to one. You need multiple SMB performance or high performance networks, otherwise it doesn't work. And I have one pool. And sometimes I have four enclosures. Oh, this time I have four enclosures. Uh, th this is kind of random. Sometimes they show up and sometimes they don't. And you restart them and sometimes they show up and don't use this in production. If I check this, it's going to show me that, hey, you have the following enclosure. That's not an enclosure. No, it's the server. It's not actually the server. It is the bus on the server. So let's say that you buy a HP DL380 G9, a generation 9, and you have, uh, and you have uh, like two controllers, the built-in that you run the operating system on, and then you have an, a 220 whatever SAS controller, and then you have another like an NVMe controller. In that case, you're going to have three enclosures in each server. So now you have 12 enclosures. That's the way they define an enclosure. It is the controller with the drives. I do have one pool. So what I can do now is, of course, create a new virtual hard drive. Uh, yes. 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 
when I specify this, it's going to tell me the total space of all the drives I have. And I do next, and I'm going to give it a name, stpool01. And since it does discover the fact that I have both SSD drives and HDD drives, I can now create a two-tier storage. And one of the new features is that, number one, we can now enable enclosure awareness in the UI. That used to be PowerShell only, but now we can define that. It doesn't really doesn't really come to good use when you do um, storage spaces direct because each enclosure is aware of being an enclosure since they are all different servers. But it depends on how it has been configured because you can still use external JBODs and in that case it makes sense to use it. But you can now specify that you want to have the faster tier in mirror or in parity which means that you could combine it in this way and say, hey, the fast tier should be mirror, but I want to like to have the standard tier using parity. If you have a fast tier that is you know, big enough to cope with the data that is changed during the day, um, and that's fine, and you want to have a massive amount of capacity, then you can do a parity of the standard tier. And then you can specify that, hey, I want to do two-way mirror, I want to do three-way mirror, with or without enclosure awareness, and I want to do single or dual parity. And then it's going to specify and say, hey, this is the whatever space you can have. Not 10 gig and one point. Okay. Um, maybe you're only going to use half of it, so five gigs. Uh, but that's weird. Let's do three way mirror. That should be less. Space then, right? <clears throat> yes. So let's flip to parity over here and do that. And that give me gives me approximately eight hundred and ninety one gigabytes. So why is that? Well, it depends on the fact that I have e an, an incorrect number of data uh, of SSD drives to fit the fact that I have four nodes. So the calculation always is depending on how many nodes you have. Then you should have this number of SSD drives to make the math to do a mirror or to do a parity or whatever you want to do. So you really need to be good at Excel. Or you build a virtual environment on your laptop and you play around with numbers until you figure out the best combination. If I buy 400 gigs SSD drives and I buy this size of, one, of, of, of HDD drives and I have the number of this and the number of this, this will give me. So that's like an IKEA kitchen planner if you ever played with that. It's like goofy. And we do that to make sure that we get the numbers right. Um, then you know approximately what you should have. Uh, I've seen so sad, so many sad faces at, at um, customers that realize that they just need one slot more and they don't have that to be able to use everything. Otherwise, they can only use 10% of it. You're right. You shouldn't look happy when I say that. You should also be, you know, sad. Yeah. <laughs> So you can specify all this, and then you create everything, and then you have a drive. So let's, let's not specify that. I have four nodes. How many virtual hard drives should I have? Well, approximately four, because if I do have four, I can put each virtual hard drive at each server, which also gives me the maximum performance of network. And this is when it comes interesting. I have four machines, assuming they have a decent network adapter, like 240 gig NICs. Then I have 80 gig of bandwidth on each server times four. Isn't that like 320 gigabyte per second? How many fiber channel adapters beats that? None. You can't. You just can't get that performance. It's very simple. So you specify this in 800. I'm going to do like 200. And I'm going to specify the size. So I don't know. 500. 
Yeah. Yeah. Like that. And then you create it. And then you're going to format it. What file system should you use? You have NTFS and, and you have REFS. And you can pick and choose. It depends on what you're going to put on it. If you're going to put documents, you should use NTFS. Unless you have a trillion of them, then you can use REFS. But if you're going to run virtual machines on it, you should absolutely use REFS. Because in 2016, they have something called offloading for the file system. So REFS, when it comes to virtual hard drives, have an offloading engine, which means that if you create a fixed virtual hard drive, it takes zero seconds, regardless of how big it is. So all disk operations are now much, much faster because it doesn't need to fill the zeros, which we need to do in NTFS to guarantee that you actually can write to the file, and that takes forever. And you're going to see this because it pops up as a default option. Um, 700 gig, I'm not going to do a drive letter, I'm just going to do next. And you can see that REFS is the default file system. It's going to be VDisk01. Not, yeah, one, you don't have data deduplication. And it also is the fact that the number of disk repair tools you have for FAT is humongous. For FAT32, great. NTFS, there's many. How many disk repair tools do you have for R? Yeah, it's called Microsoft Support. And you call them and you, you cry, and then they will help you. The basic idea is this, REFS cannot break because it's built basically on a database. It's the, many years ago, Microsoft said, we're going to invent a new file system. They called it WinFX at that time. And people were like, oh, it's a new file system. And then it just vanished. It didn't really vanish. It turned into REFS. So it's, it's based, basically based on a database with some intelligent logic. I mean... M the, 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 the fat table, that's like having a poster on the wall with all the IP addresses and say, we use DHCP here. If you want an IP address, you go to the board and then you set, set your name next to it. That's called dynamic host. No, it's not really. It's, just, it's very simple. So there's a lot of tools for it. Uh, so far, we have not had any crashes using the REFS file system, but we only use it for... For, uh, for virtual machines. We do have one customer that actually needed to call Microsoft support last week. They were using REFS over an iSCSI connection and the network broke down. Whoops. Called me and said, do you have any tools? Nope. <laughs> but I have a phone number. Oh, great. Uh, you're not gonna like me when I tell you the phone number. Uh, but they called and they were getting help and it took them an hour to solve the problem. Four, two, four, five. So now I have a five. So what's the purpose of using this? Can you use the storage spaces direct solution for anything? No, you can't. You can only use it for two things. Well, you can use it for other things. It's primarily designed to, to use for with Hyper-V and a story. Hyper-V is the primary usage. You can, in some scenarios, run SQL Server against it, but that depends on the SQL application itself. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But you can also use this as just storage because you want to have a bunch. You, you just need storage, so you're going to create a file share. And, hey, you know, backup data or anything like that, depending on what you buy. So you can use it for basically anything. It depends on how you expose it. But the design is meant for building fabric with Hyper-V. Can't, can't you connect a, a VMware machine to this? In theory, you can, because it does support something called NFS. Well, great, so then you can create NFS, absolutely. So the NFS share is going to be highly available. But when you do SMB3 and scale out file servers, they are going to be continuously available. 
So what's the difference between high availability and continuous availability? Well, continuous availability means it's always on, and you can, as long as you connect to any of these machines, you still have access to the file. And when you fail over, it doesn't really happen anything at all. Just you still have the connections, right? But if you have a highly available solution, then you move the resource from one node to the other node. And there's going to be a small pause in between. And if you pause 400 VMware machines and say, you're going to lose your hard drive for just a few seconds. And I'm not going to tell you that. Some of them will survive and some of them will not. And when user log on to the server, when the admin logs on to the server, it's going to be like the previous shutdown was really unexpected. No kidding. <laughs> so it's from a technical standpoint possible, but I wouldn't put it in production. And it's not recommended by Microsoft either. So what's the benefit against the SAN? Money. Money and performance. This runs in circle around any SAN we ever see. It is insane. For about a sixth down to a tenth of the cost of a SAN, you get approximately six times or ten times the performance with the same capacity. So when we build systems with storage spaces, not storage spaces direct, but storage spaces, the primary reason is the customer needs to change the storage solution. And we tell them about storage spaces and we show them that and I go like, hey, that's, this is, <laughs> this kicks ass. Yes, it does. Is there any catch? Well, you can't run VMware. Okay, we can change. Because if you sell, I mean, really, if, if, you, can, if you can save, let's say 15 million Danish kroner and you get 10 times the performance, Shifting from being aware to Hyper-V will become a whatever. Because it's not important anymore. You know, it's the same way always. We can't move to Office 365 because of blah, blah, blah. And then two months later, you meet a customer. Now, we moved to Office 365. You couldn't do that last month. No, but it's darn cheap. Hmm. <laughs> Makes sense, right? Money always talks. Um, so this is how it works. Um, if you are going to play with storage spaces direct, I strongly recommend you to play with it in a virtual environment so you really understand what you're doing. You also need to find one of these spreadsheet calculators to figure out approximately how much storage you should have. And you also need to buy proper hardware. And that is a decent server with a lot of hard drives in it. And they cannot sit on a RAID controller. They need to sit on a SATA or a SAS controller because Windows is becoming the RAID controller. It's very simple. Yes, sir. No. You set everything in pass-through. So if you go for HP servers, I know them. Um, most of the RAID controllers they have, even the built-in ones, if you go into the BIOS, there's a, a pass-through mode. So you still you see that. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. I don't know. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure, but I know what you're talking about, but I, have, I haven't played with it. The, um, the only thing you need to be aware of is that when you can see the disk type, which you can see here, you can see the bus type, it says SAS. It needs to say SAS, NVMe, or SATA. It cannot say RAID. In that case, it's fine. Because that is the only thing Microsoft doesn't support. If there is a RAID upon a RAID, they don't support it. So as long as the drive or the disk is presented as SAS, SATA, or NVMe, it's going to be fine. It's going to be supported. It does work to doing a RAID on a RAID. It's just not supported and not very bright either, but that's another story. But it does work. 
And you can see that the enclosure that shows up here is not really the enclosure. I mean, that's really the virtual machine in this case, but it works this way. Now, there's another thing you need to be aware of. In this case, we had four servers, right? It's cool, four servers. And they are connected using a network. That's also fine. Now, there's two kinds of, of network traffic. I'm going to do it this way. We have what's called the north-south bound connection. And then we have the east-west bound connection. The east-west bound connection is the replication traffic. And the north-south bound traffic is in and out from the cluster storage solution, right? Now, you cannot get more performance north-south then you have east-west. And the network you need to have is at least 10 gigabit ethernet. You can't do it below that. It doesn't work. Yeah, of course it works. It's just horribly slow. So it cannot be used in reality, but you can play with it. Um, the recommendation here is to run 40 gig network or 56, or even 100. Now, a 40 gig network or a 56 gig network is, is pretty expensive, right? Well, that depends on the vendor. If you go to a vendor that doesn't start with a C, or H, or any of those vendors, you can buy InfiniBand switches. And then you can remove the last zero, and then you have the price. So a 36 port, lossless, 40, 56 gig switch is approximately 36,000, no, 60,000 Swedish crowns, which is approximately two Danish crowns. Or three, maybe three, is it three? I can't remember. So, and that's pretty cheap, right? Compared to other things, uh, we asked another vendor, uh, and they gave us the same switch with the same capacity for about 250,000 Swedish crowns. Like, why would I buy that? It has a lot of features, and I'm going to turn them off all of them. Because since we're using the switches in the hypervisor, even if you're not going to do Hyper-V on the storage, we still install Hyper-V because then we can have the logical switch in the software, then I really need a stupid switch with a massive capacity. It, but it doesn't have to be intelligent. I can buy an unmanaged 40 gig switch. Well, then you can't manage it. Well, it's not really a switch. It's just going to be a port forwarder anyway, because the real switch is going to be in the software, software defined. So Microsoft really does have a hard time finding stupid switches with a massive capacity. And that means that the hardware, the entire hardware industry is now being forced to change into deliver quality, performance, but stupid. Like stupid people. Uh, sorry, I don't like stupid people. So that's the way it works. Oops, no, too fast. And it says on the top, Azure, the inspired infrastructure. And the first time I saw this slide myself, I was like, I, I didn't really react on that fact. But the, the more I'm playing with it, the more I realize that the focus is to build a small version of Azure at your home. Because that is what Microsoft is doing. That's how they build infrastructure. That's the only way they build infrastructure. And everything is virtualized on top of that. And they go, oh, well, we have a, you know, SQL Server doesn't work. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't work really great virtualized. Really? Because that's the only way they test it. That's the only way they develop, develop it. And they don't have any physical SQL servers. Everything is virtualized. Yeah, but, yeah, but still. No. <laughs> it's just virtualized because it's easier. So it is very important. They do other things as well. Uh, for instance, the um, uh, storage quality of services. 
um, they have the storage spaces replica or they have storage replica, which means that you can replicate, which is kind of nice. We can replicate within a cluster. That means you can now build a stretch cluster. Two sites, that's nice. Uh, but you can also replicate between cluster. That's also nice. So you have one cluster over here and you replicate storage to that cluster over here. But then you can also do server to server. Well, okay, that's cool. And then you can do server to self. And I was like, what? Why would you ever do server to self? Because then you have a real-time copy of your entire whatever you want to have a real-time copy of. And whenever someone says, can you send me a copy of your running environment? Yeah, give me a minute. You pull out the hard drive and you send it away. And it's like, this is, this is exactly what we were running six minutes ago. Is that a backup? No, it's, an, <clears throat> it's a very nice to have a copy back at home. <laughs> What's that? Well, it's a, you know, it's an entire environment. I left it on the train as a really bad thing to do. <clears throat> so they have all this, right? Um, they also do other things to support running VMs. So for instance, we now have the ability to modify things like memory while the machine is running. We can't change between dynamic and static memory, but if we do have dynamic, we can then change within the dynamic parameters. If we do have static memory, we can change within um, whatever memory we want to have. So just bumping up and bumping down, which is kind of nice. We can also add network adapters on the fly. We can name the network adapters, and they support what's called dev device naming, which means that Jacob over here likes automation, but he doesn't like MAC addresses because MAC addresses are unique per VM. But if Jacob wants to build a solution where he can build and repeat building a firewall or a gateway, then he would love to have the name of the network adapter to be named internal and external. And then you can find out that name inside the virtual machine using PowerShell. Instead of generating a unique MAC address and then figure out what MAC address it has and so on and so on, because it's all, it's going to work. It's just nasty to play with, so they changed that as well. You can't do it in the UI, though. Well, they can. And I'm, that's gonna, I'm gonna show you because it's so fun. You can see the name of that network adapter. It says network adapter. And of course, you can add a new network adapter. You go to hardware and you say an add network adapter, and you go add, and then you connect it if you want to. And then you can enable device naming but you can't set the name. So now you have two network adapters with the name of network adapter, but you can see the name inside the VM. So can you get me all the network adapters with the name of network adapter? Here they are, <laughs> all of them. But using PowerShell, there's a dash name, and now you can give it a name. Well, it doesn't really make sense to have that checkbox when you can't give it a name, but anyway, that's the way they did it. They also did something else. They did checkpoints for Hyper-V, which is kind of fun. Everybody is today is using standard checkpoints. And with 2016, you can shift to production checkpoints. Hold on. <laughs> Whoa, that may, uh, so we're not running production checkpoints today. No, you're not. But we used them in production. Uh-huh. <laughs> but there's also the little note in the in the bottom page it says do not use snapshots in production the difference between them is not really production and non-production it is the difference is what do you want to be consistent when you do a production checkpoint the data is consistent when you do a snapshot with a standard then the state is consistent that means that, for instance, if it is, this is a, a virtual file server or a virtual SQL server, you most likely would like to be data consistent. Otherwise, it's kind of useless to be able to bring it back when the data is destroyed because you were in the middle of a transaction in the SQL server and it's either going to roll forward or roll back. 
darn, I don't want to have that. No, you don't want to have that. But if this machine happens to be a gateway server, it is a virtual appliance gateway and, and remote desktop, whatever, something like that, that doesn't really contain data. It's a state because you're logged on to the machine or it has a bunch of firewall rules running around. And then a standard snapshot might be better because when you restore that machine from snapshot, it's going to be in the same state because it's just going to be popping up. Now, that also means that production snapshots or checkpoints use VSS, volume shadow copy oh, services to do this. Let's say that you have another backup application that also uses VSS that truncates the log files. And this one is also doing a VSS backup that, that also truncates the log file. That's going to work really nice until you try to do a restore. Because now the transaction log from one of the applications is missing. So we now fall back to one of the best out, uh, forum questions I ever seen. There's a guy in this DPM forum that says, is it possible to do a backup of a live running domain controller? And one guy in the DPM team says, yes, absolutely. However, you can't do a restore. <laughs> and it's the correct answer because people are always trying to get a decent backup solution. Really? Is that what you want? The ability to do a backup? I thought it was the ability to restore data that was the goal. And maybe you should consider the fact that you really need to verify that you actually can restore data without losing data, oh, because that's not really the same thing. Just think of that for a couple of seconds when you do this. Uh, and indeed other things as well. For application, they did a lot of things, and one of them is going to be the Nano server. But before we dig into that, um, they recently announced the fact that the, the full UI in the server core is only going to be available as the LTSP versions, long-term servicing branch, meaning every two years there will be a new version of Windows Server 2016 or three years or whatever year it's going to be, but it's going to be supported for 10 years. Those two third-party applications, RDS experience, that is for really old stuff, older than me stuff. It's application that is a walking share. That's what you use that server for, right? And if you can, you could, of course, use Server Core. It's slightly lighter. It's not really lighter, but it doesn't have Internet Explorer patches, which is nice to not have. LTSP, that one, the Nano Server, that's only available as current branch. So you will have new versions of the Nano Server two, maybe three times every year. So if you need new features in Hyper-V, if you need new features for application platforms, if you, if you would like the new stuff, you need to run Nano. Nano is headless. Nano means fully automated solutions, fully scriptable solutions. And this is where the divider starts to happen. You either are an old guy that runs DNS or DHCP and think that's the coolest thing ever created. And then you use the UI servers and LTSP and long term and yada yada. Or you are running a modern platform where the hypervisor is running a nano and storage spaces director is running nano. And you use one of these GUI servers to manage it. Well, you use PowerShell to manage it or System Center or something like that. Now, um, it supports container, they're going to co co contain it later on. But a nano server is pretty neat. I like the nano server. The best thing with a nano server is that you need to be a genius to break it. Because you can't log on to it and do anything. Oh, well, you can turn off the network adapter. That doesn't require you to be a genius. But it's really hard to destroy 
And that also means that it needs to be redeployed. And we know, we, I mean, we're running Nano today, right? We don't fix them. It's broken. Yeah. Deploy a new one. And then some of you say, well, doesn't it contain data? Nope. If it runs application, the application is a distributed application. Okay, so, but you know, VMs, well, it runs in a VM cluster. So the VM is highly available. And that's going to run on another node if the first node breaks down. Well, in storage, the storage solution is clustered. This is like having, this is the difference between having one bunny and 15,000 cows. If you have one bunny and it gets sick, you get to the vet. You pay 6,000 bucks to get it x-rayed, but you know the price of a new bunny is like a buck or something like that. But if you have 15,000 cows and one of them gets sick, you fire up the barbecue and you have a party. And you create the new cow. Well, they create them themselves. It's very simple. You just have two different cows and then have another one after a while. The way to manage Nano Server is to either use PowerShell or to use System Center Virtual Machine Manager. And since I have approximately <laughs> nothing left, right, Ronnie? I have one minute. I can see him dance. Uh, in the next session, we're going to cover System Center Virtual Machine Manager, which is going to be the engine or the management tool for most of the system of the fun fun new functions in Windows Server 2016. And again, that's where the focus is to build the Fabric platform. I did have a training for a customer yesterday, and it's a VMware shop. Nice guys, they do VMware. They have a traditional SAN. And they were like, well, either we change, and then we have a lot of fun features we can use, or we don't change, and we we don't need to know anything at all. True. Because if you have a script that creates a DNS server in 2012, it's going to work the same way in 2016. So it's going to be this way. You either stay old, or you change direction and use other features in the server. With that said, you have now 15 minutes break, right?